as you all know, one of my teaching positions is in a Russian university, Southern Federal University in Rostov on Don, in south of Russia. Rostov on Don is the forward base for the military in its invasion of Ukraine. So I have a bit of a personal connection to the invasion, however, inadvertently and indirectly. In January 2003, that's about 20 years ago, I published an essay with United Press International, UPI. I published an essay on one Vladimir Putin. No one knew who is Putin. He was a newcomer to the political scene in Russia. He had replaced the corrupt and drunk Yeltsin. And so everyone welcomed him as a relief. But some thought that he was a comic relief <laughs> and how wrong they were. It reminded me of how people had first perceived Adolf Hitler when he came to power in 1933. They all wrote him off as a clown, but they were dead wrong. Now, Vladimir Putin has been a mid-level functionary with the KGB, the Russian security services, and then um, an even lower level functionary in the municipality of St. Petersburg where he plugged into clannish relationships with mentors and tutors and political um, kind of um, fathers. He became a protege of some political figures. And gradually he climbed the ladder. But then surprisingly, he was catapulted to the number one position in Russia. Well, not at the beginning, but within, within very few years, he had been catapulted. To the number one position and no one knew where he came from and where he was going. In 2003, 20 years ago, at the very inception of his career, I attempted an appraisal and risked, went out on a limb and risked a few predictions. One of these predictions said that within a few years Putin will be forced into a war in Eastern Europe, probably with one of the countries that had formerly been incorporated in the USSR. And right I've been. What I would like to do is read this essay to you because it had aged well and I think it holds very true and contains many, many clues as to the personality of this enigmatic uh, political leader. Some consider him a ruffian, a thug, and a scoundrel. Others, like Donald Trump, consider him a strategic genius. Mind you, uh, being appraised or evaluated by Donald Trump as a genius is hardly a compliment, but still. Okay, let's get to the point. Let me read to you the essay. The essay is titled Russia's Second Empire was published in January 2003, United Press International, and it starts this way. Peter the Great oriented a reluctant Russia toward, towards the West, its technologies and its work ethics, if not its values. Two centuries later, Russian aristocracy was French, its military and commerce were German, its monarchy have British, its culture and literature, at the core of mainstream Europe. Putin is aiming to reverse all this by firewalling Russia, winning it off its dependence on the West and reorienting it towards Asia, from China to the Middle East. It is a gargantuan reversal. Remember, this essay had been written in 2003, 20 years ago, literally a year or two after Putin had come to power and was an unknown quantity. Okay, continue with the essay. And I want to draw one such parallel between Putin and another leader in history. We start with an overview. Karl Marx regarded Louis Napoleon's Second Empire as the first modern dictatorship, supported by the middle and upper classes, but independent of their patronage, and thus self-perpetuating. Others went as far as calling it proto-fascistic. Yet the Second Empire 
was insufficiently authoritarian or revolutionary to warrant this title. It did foster and encourage a personality cult akin to the Führer Prinzip, but it derived its legitimacy conservatively from the church and from the electorate. It was an odd mixture of Bonapartism, militarism, clericalism, conservatism, and liberalism. In a way, the Second Republic did amount to a secular religion, replete with martyrs and apostles. It made use of the nascent mass media to manipulate public opinion. It pursued industrialization and administrative modernization. But these features characterized all the political movements of the late 19th century, including socialism and other empires, such as the Habsburg, Austro-Hungary. The Second Empire was above all inertial. It sought to preserve the bureaucratic, regulatory and economic frameworks of the First Empire. It was a rationalist, positivist and materialistic movement, despite the deliberate irrationalism of the young Louis Napoleon. It was not affiliated to a revolutionary party. It was not affiliated to popular militias. It was not collectivist, and its demise was the outcome of a military defeat. The Second Empire is very reminiscent of Vladimir Putin's reign in post-Yeltsin Russia, I wrote in 2003. Like the French Second Empire, it follows a period of revolutions and counter-revolutions in Russia. It is not identified with any one class, but does rely on the support of the middle class, the intelligentsia, the managers and industrialists, the security services, and the military. Putin is authoritarian, but not revolutionary. His regime derives its legitimacy from parliamentary and presidential elections based on a neoliberal model of government. It is socially conservative, but seeks to modernize Russia's administration and economy. Yet it manipulates the mass media and encourages a personality cult. Like Napoleon, Napoleon III, Putin started off as president. He was shortly prime minister under Yeltsin. Like Louis Napoleon, Putin may be undone by a military defeat, probably in the Caucasus or Central Asia. The formative years of Putin and Louis Napoleon have little in common, though. The former, Putin, was a cosseted member of the establishment and had witnessed firsthand the disintegration of his country. Putin was a KGB, a Pagachik. The KGB may have inspired, conspired in, or even instigated the transformation in Russian domestic affairs since the early 1980s, but to call it revolutionary would be to stretch the word. Louis Napoleon, on the other hand, was a true revolutionary. He narrowly escaped death at the hands of Austrian troops in a rebellion in, it in Italy in 1831. His brother was not as lucky, by the way. Louis Napoleon's claim to the throne of France in 1832 was based on a half-baked ideology of imperial glory concocted, disseminated and promoted by him. In 1836 and in 1840, he even initiated failed coup d'etat. He was expelled even from neutral Switzerland, which is quite an achievement, and he was exiled to the United States of America, where else? He spent six years in prison. Still, like Putin, Napoleon III was elected president, and like Putin, he was regarded by his political sponsors as merely a useful and disposable instrument. Like Putin, Louis Napoleon had no parliamentary or political experience. Both of these leaders won elections by promising order and prosperity, coupled with social compassion. And exactly like Putin, Louis Napoleon, to the great ch chagrin of his backers, proved to be his own man, independent-minded, determined, and tough. Putin, like Louis Napoleon before him, proceeded to expand his powers and installed loyalists in every corner of the administ administration and the army. And like Louis Napoleon, Putin is a populist, traveling throughout the country, posing for photo opportunities, responding to citizens' queries in Q&A radio shows, siding with the average bloke on every occasion, 
taking advantage of Russia's previous economic and social disintegration to project an image of a strong man. Putin, Putin is as little dependent on the Duma, Russia's parliament, as Napoleon III was on his parliament. But Putin ripped what Boris Yeltsin, his predecessor, had sown when he established an imperial presidency after what amounted to a coup d'etat in 1993 and the bombing of the Duma. Napoleon had to organize his own coup d'etat all by himself in 1852. Napoleon III, exactly as Putin did, faced a delicate balancing act between the legitimacy conferred by parliamentary li liberalism and the need to maintain a police state. When he sought to strengthen the enfeebled legislature, he reaped only growing opposition within it to his domestic and foreign policies alike. So Louis Napoleon liberalized the media and enshrined in France's legal code various civil freedoms, but he also set in motion and sanctioned penumbral or pervasive and clandestine security apparatus, which regularly gathered information on millions of Frenchmen and on foreigners. Putin doesn't amount to, doesn't, doesn't, didn't go that far. Putin is considerably less of an economic modernizer than was Napoleon III. Putin also seems to be less interested in the social implications of his policies, in poverty alleviation, and in growing economic inequalities and social tensions within Russia. Napoleon III was a man for all seasons, a buffer against socialism, as well as a utopian social and administrative reformer. Business flourished under Napoleon III, as it does, or did uh, rather, under Putin. Remember, the essay was written, published in 2003. The 1850s witnessed rapid technological change, even more rapid than today's, by the way. France became a popular destination for foreign investors. Napoleon III was the natural ally of domestic businessmen until he embarked on an unprecedented trade liberalization campaign in 1860. Similarly, Putin is nudging Russia towards WTO membership and enhanced foreign competition, alienating in the process the tycoon oligarchs, the industrial complex and the energy behemoths. What about foreign policy? Napoleon III was a free trader, and so is Putin, by the way. Napoleon III believed in the beneficial economic effects of free markets and in the free exchange of goods, capital, and labor. So does Putin. But economic liberalism does not always translate to a pacific foreign policy. Napoleon III sought to annul the decisions of the Congress of Vienna in 1815 and to reverse the trend of post-Napoleonic French humiliation. He wanted to resurrect Great France, pretty much as Putin wants to restore Russia to its rightful place as a superpower. But both pragmatic leaders realize that this rehabilitation cannot be achieved by force of arms and with a dilapidated economy. Napoleon III tried to co-opt the tidal wave of modern revolutionary nationalism to achieve the revitalization of France and the concomitant restoration of its glory. Putin strives to exploit the West's aversion to conflict and addiction to wealth. Napoleon III struggled to establish a new, inclusive European order, as does Putin with NATO and to a lesser degree with the European Union today. Remember, this was 2003. Putin artfully manipulated Europe in the wake of the September 11 terrorist attacks on the United States, his newfound ally. Putin may yet find himself in the enviable position of Europe's arbitrator, NATO's most weighty member, a bridge between Central Asia, the Caucasus, North Korea and China, and the United States. The longer Putin's tenure, the more likely he is to become Europe's elder statesman. This is a maneuver reminiscent of Louis Napoleon's following the Crimean War, when he teamed up with Great Britain against Russia. Like Putin, Napoleon III had modernized and professionalized his army. But unlike Putin hitherto, Napole Louis Napoleon actually did go to war against Austria, moved by his off-thwarted 
colonial and mercantilist aspirations. And here is this segment of the essay, which is, which is a bit prophetic. Putin is likely to follow the, the same path as Louis Napoleon, probably in, in Central Asia, but possibly also in the Baltic and Eastern Europe as well. Reinvigorated armies and industrialists often force expansionary wars upon their reluctant ostensible political masters. Should Putin fail in his military adventures, as Napoleon III did in his, and should he be deposed as Napoleon had been, these eerie similarities will have come to their natural conclusion. This essay is published in January 2003.